to 6874, etc. Uh, last time we talked a lot about metrics for machine learning and just gave an overview of the subject. And you may be asking yourself, where does the biology start? Um, the answer to that question is in about after next week, the week after is when the biology starts. We're going to be giving you a very um, solid foundation in deep learning technologies for the first two weeks, just so we all have a common vocabulary. And then we'll be moving on to the application of these techniques to various problems in uh, gene regulation, um, imaging, and so forth uh, as the term progresses. Just as a reminder, recitations are today and tomorrow at 4 p.m. in 36.156. Bring your computers. Uh, this is going to be a complete uh, startup for you. There is a ungraded problem set zero. You'll have an opportunity to load and have fun with. Okay. Yes, good. Um, and the teaching staff will be standing by to answer any questions you have. So if you feel at all intimidated by anything from downloading things into a Python notebook to the structure of what things are going to look like in class or redeeming your coupon, and this is a great opportunity to get some uh, help. So today we're going to turn to how we can train uh, deep neural networks of a fully connected variety and what are some of the pitfalls uh, engaged in that. And I think that we heard last time some people are concerned about overfitting and what can we really learn from these networks? I mean, how trustworthy are they to tell us informative things about the underlying biology we're studying? But let's begin with baselines. It's always very important whenever you do a study to have a good baseline to see how well you're performing better than a fairly naive method. So imagine that we had a set of points that we wish to classify as red or blue, uh, and on the x-axis is wealth increasing from left to right, and on the y-axis is some measure of religiousness from uh, bottom to top, uh, and these blue and uh, red dots could correspond to people, for example, a particular political affiliations, if you might. Um, but the idea is that we are giving this training set where we actually know what the, the red and the blue dots are, and I will say this has been generated according to some decision boundary that is not completely obvious on the slide behind you. And what we would like to do is when I give you a new set of dots, right? So I give you a new set of dots. I say, um, what is the label of these dots? If, we're, if we obscure the labels that are present, how accurately can we classify these dots? So one way to approach this is to use what's called a k-nearest neighbors algorithm. We simply ask, who are they near uh, in this training set? So if we looked at the training set and what it defined as neighborhoods, you can see the red and the blue neighborhoods defined by proximity to the training examples. So you're asking, where is the closest neighbor and what is their color? And that's the color I'm going to take for my test set example, right? Fairly straightforward algorithm. It works extraordinarily well. Typically, this is the algorithm to beat whenever you're trying to build a classifier. Is to take your training set, build a K nearest neighbor's classifier, and see whether or not you can exceed its performance. Now, this is one neighbor. What happens if we consider more than one neighbor? For example, if we go from one neighbor, this is the classification, to say three neighbors, and they all have to vote. We pick an odd number of neighbors, so there's always a tiebreaker. And here you can see the relative color of the little square corresponds to the number of neighbors voting in a particular direction, right? So you can see there's a, a decision boundary that seems to be evolving. We still have some, some blue at the top of the uh, diagram here. But you can see that the neighbors are voting. And as we increase the number of neighbors, as shown in the next slide, there are 29 neighbors. You can see the decision boundary that was originally used to generate uh, the training data is clear. Is everybody, are there any questions at all about k-nearest neighbors and how it functions? Okay, great. This is a great baseline algorithm. So I just wanted to point out something about model complexity. Uh, we'll touch upon this again next week. The idea is that if you have a straight line, it can classify a total of three points, no matter where the three points are placed. And if you have four points, however, you cannot 
classify four points with a straight line if you choose where their locations are. So a straight line is not capable, it doesn't have sufficient capacity to be able to classify four points. So what we could do then is we could define um, the capacity of a classifier in terms of its VC dimension or the number of points it could be, it's able to classify if the points are placed by an adversary. So the adversary is gonna try to make this as hard as possibly can for you. And if your model is able to classify K points, then it has that capacity. Is that clear to everybody? Great, okay. Now that you know all about K nearest neighbors and you know about VC dimension, what is the VC dimension of a K nearest neighbors classifier? What do you think? The number of data points you have. Number of training data points. Exactly right. So the capacity of a K nearest neighbor classifier grows as the size of the training data set, which is a very interesting property. It's very powerful, right? So that's just one way to think about this is that um, it has this flexibility to be able to classify a large number of points precisely. Now, the generalizability of a model describes to how well it works on previously unseen inputs. And we're gonna be exploring generalizability a little bit later on. It's a very important concept. And furthermore, last time we touched upon this idea of both in-distribution examples and out-of-distribution examples. An in-distribution example is an example is drawn from the same distribution of the training set, whereas an out of distribution example is drawn from a distribution that the model has never seen before during training. So for example, imagine that you train a um, multi-class classifier just on the digits zero through eight and never showed it a nine. And then during testing, you showed it a nine. Well, that's sort of out of distribution, right? You wouldn't expect it to do very well on an out of distribution input. Okay, so we're gonna return now, uh, now that we have our baseline of a K nearest neighbors classifier and the idea of capacity, which are important concepts, to uh, are the model that we introduced for problem set one, which I've also shown up here on the board. Can people at the back see this? Yes. Uh, on the last slide, you're talking about generalization. The example you gave, the out of distribution sample, are you just talking about testing data versus training data, or are you talking about asking it to classify something it's never been taught to classify? The, the intuition, the other distribution examples come in the testing data. In other words, other distribution means it's not, it's not in the distribution that was trained on, so it's not in the training set distribution. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the points are something from the same distribution. What do you mean that the points are not sample? The points are not sample from the same distribution that test the like training set. What I'm implying is that in the training data and the test data, yes. and both these samples from the same distribution. Well, like okay, the, the, the question is can the training data and the test data be sampled from the same distribution? The answer is yes, that's typically what you see in the literature. But if you're working at Tesla, right, and somebody's driving a car, you can't have actually collected all the data for all the possible road signs they're gonna see, right? And so you're gonna get out of distribution data coming at you and you need to figure out what to do about that. You know, accelerating and turning off the brake system is probably not a good idea. So it means that you need to have a concept of what other distribution inputs look like and how to detect them. Because these systems will give you an answer no matter what you give it, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's it'll do it. All right. Hey, there, 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 there. Yeah. Um, so you haven't seen every stop sign of the planet, but you've seen a bunch of stop signs that's still in distribution, whereas a sign from another country that you've never seen before, that's out of distribution. So it's not a question of have I seen every training example, but have I seen Thank you. 
maybe be something that. Okay, so just returning to uh, our setup for problem set one. In the, in the back, can you see this writing? Can you give me a thumbs up or thumbs down? It's positive acknowledgement. Yes, you can see this. Okay. The idea is that we have a, a linear transform and a set of input features x1 for xm, so we have m of them. We um, so multiply by a matrix and add an offset or a bias. We get these logits, of which there are 10 of them, right? So we're finding the 10 digits. We map them through the softmax function to get probabilities out, which are classified as y hat 1 through y hat n. These are the 10 probabilities of the different digits. And then we use a cross entropy loss with the actual labels to get a loss on a particular training example. And here I am omitting the superscripts i because all these have to do with a particular training example, just so you don't have to write down a bazillion superscripts for no reason. Okay. So this is the setup, right? And the way that the logits are formed is we simply take the weights to that particular um, logit index to multiply times the input feature and add the offset. The softmax conversion here, which is a nonlinear operator, takes the logits and normalizes them by the sum of all of the logits. The idea being that this gives you a probability of the back end. So we're guaranteed that all of these probabilities sum to one by virtue of the way this is constructed. And then the, the loss here is simply a cross entropy loss, much like the, the binary cross entropy loss we saw last time where we have the actual label and our probability of that label. Um, and we take this over all the possible classes and we sum this up to get our loss. Note that if we had the correct label, which is one, let's say in class one, and the probability is one, then the log would be zero and the loss would be zero. So if we get the right answer with probability one, the loss goes to zero, okay? So this is the setup. Uh, for problems at one and for the example I'm going to use today. Are there any questions at all? Please, if there are any questions about the details, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. So we're going to uh, then look at this as a special case of a more general framework, right? Where we have a set of inputs or features, we have weights. We uh, can sum them together as we do here in this summation. Uh, we run them through a nonlinear transform, which we do here, the softmax, and then we get an output, which is our probability. And here we are scoring them with a cross entropy loss. Right? So this figure is sort of a more general version of what we're seeing over here. Now, the particular nonlinear function that we use, we'll discuss today. Uh, but here, we're using a function that has the property, it's converting the logits into a stream of probabilities at some point. Now, we can look at uh, these nonlinear functions at the output sort of in two classes. There is the class of nonlinear functions that we use in the final stage of a series of transforms that are giving us a very nice property, like a probability that sums to one over all the possibles that we're looking at. However, that constrains the output values, say, between zero and one. Uh, other kinds of nonlinear functions uh, don't have that property, but they're better for internal nonlinear functions inside of our, our network. And a very positive one is something called a rectified linear unit, which looks like this. It's very simple. Anything below zero is zero, and anything above zero is linear in the input. This is called a ReLU, a rectified linear unit. We'll be using this quite a bit. And this has the property that you note know, that it doesn't <clears throat> constrain the output of a layer to have any particular value. And thus, it can be used in the internal part of a network. And thus, these external or last layer nonlinear functions really are appropriate when we wish to scale things or interpretability like probability. And we'll be talking uh, about these various kinds of things, but suffice to say, softmax and its relatives are very appropriate for probability based on classifiers, and ReLU is used for 
many different things. Okay, so we've seen this single layer neural network and we can generalize this of course, we can compose these functions together like so and have many different layers and we can train all the layers in the same fashion as we'll see. But the idea is to stack the layers on top of one another. Now, imagine I told you that the operator that I was going to use at the output of each layer was linear. Would it matter that you had more than one layer? No. Great. Who said that? Okay. Good job. Okay. Good job. Yes. <laughs> you took a chance. You went for it. Good. Uh, the reason is that if you have linear outputs, you can collapse them all into one layer so simply by combining the weights together. So a multi-layer network only makes sense when you have nonlinear outputs on after each layer. Otherwise, you could collapse layers together. Can you repeat that? A multi-layer network only makes sense when you have nonlinear outputs after each layer. Otherwise, you could collapse layers together into an equivalent combined layer. Okay. Great. So now, when we want to do updates of our weights, we have this loss function <laughs> at the end here. Uh, Um, and what we would like to looking at, one way to think about this is that if I wiggle on weight one, like if I grab weight one and I wiggle on it, right, how much is the loss changing on the output? And if the loss increases, I don't want to move the weight in that direction, right? So what I want to do is I want to wiggle the weight in the direction that reduces the loss, which corresponds to this partial derivative here, which is computed by the chain rule. So I can compute the partial derivative of each step of the network in turn until I get to the product which tells me what the loss change is with the corresponding change in the weight. It's a very important concept. This is what back propagation is all about. The idea that I can chain together these partial derivatives and thus figure out how to change my weight to reduce my loss. Okay? Make sense? We're going to go through an example here in just a second. Any questions about that at all? So we're going to actually compute how to do this for our particular example. Now, there are two ways of thinking about doing this. You could actually do this all numerically, although TensorFlow and other systems actually do this symbolically. So what they will do is they will actually compute the symbolic derivative chained together of whatever functions you have to make things very efficient. And so we're going to play that part of TensorFlow today. We're going to actually do the symbolic differentiation to see what falls out. So to that end, let's take a particular example. So here we have a network that's very similar to this one in its back part. Professor Callis will be telling you about the left part next week which is actually how to generate input features for our linear layer. So that's going to be the treat for next week, okay? But suffice to say, we have, say, n inputs into our linear layer, which actually corresponds to this figure right here. We have our um, softmax function, which takes the logits and converts them into probabilities, whether it's a cat, dog, or a bird. So it's a three-class classifier. And you get a loss value of back end. Okay? Make sense? All right, so let's just look at how this works. So the, note that what's coming into the cross-sector function is that one hot encoding of what the true class is. What we're looking at is a doll, and therefore it's not a cat, it's not a bird, so we get zero, one, zero as our input for true y as the labels, right? So what that means is the loss is equal to, now if we look at this, 
equation right here, y sub j is only going to be one for the true class. It's going to be zero for all the other ones. So all we're dealing with here is that the loss is equal to minus log y hat of the true class, we call it c. Okay. That's that's our loss. And um, if we look at this, if we then further expand this, we can express this in terms of y sub c using this equation, right? Because y sub c, the correct class, came from this softbacks that computed the corresponding number of logins, right? So what we can do then is we can say that this is equal to the um, log of p to the z c over the sum of k equals one and the p z k. That's it. Are you with me so far? We just took y sub c and replaced it like so. Got it? Back row, you with me? Okay, good. All right. You ready to do logarithms here? What do we get here? Pardon? We get <clears throat> minus e to the zc, right? Plus the log of this, which is k equals one to n e to the z, like so, right? Because we take the log of this, this is a division, so it's the log of this, this, which is, um, should it be e or just e? Oh, sorry. Minus zc. So we take the log of this, we get minus zc plus the log of the denominator, right? This whole thing was negative, as you recall. All right, so how about if we differentiate the log with respect to, say, zj? What do we get? Well, here's what we're differentiating. What is the differential of this term with respect to zj? Well, it's equal to zero unless c is equal to j. When c is equal to j, it's going to be minus one. So we'll say that this is minus one. We we'll need this little selection operator here when j is equal to c. Otherwise, uh, the um, if we take the derivative of this term, right? We get one over x, this is log x, one over x, which is one over the sum of k equal one to n of e to the z k. And then dx is going to be the derivative of this sum. But that's going to be zero for every term except. Um, this term, right? And what we'll get out of this is e to the z j like that. Well, this is equal to what's this? That is equal to y sub j, y hat sub j minus one on y to the z. So the derivative of the loss with respect to zj is equal to that quantity over there. So what's really interesting about this is that the loss that gets pushed backwards, but there's the same derivation right there on the slide, um, is the probability that you actually originally thought that class was. So for example, we thought that it was a problem of a cat of 0.23 originally. That's the loss of, that's the, um, you have to push backwards. And the same thing is true for bird. We thought it was a bird, but probably 0.14. So it gets pushed back as 0.14. And for dog, we subtracted one from it. So we wind up with a negative 0.37. Now, when we later on begin to update things, we subtract off this derivative, right? Which means that 
We're going to like dogs, and we're not going to like cats and birds. If you think about what's going on here. So we're headed in the right direction. We've got the right kind of backward partial being propagated. Okay. Now, let's ask another question, which is what we really would like to have now is the change in z sub j with respect to, say, some weight of um, j sub k in our original. So here's our original weight that we made the z's. We'd like to know how to change this weight to make things better for us in the next iteration after we've done this training step. So we want to update wj sub k. So we need to figure out what this derivative is. What is this derivative if you look at that summation up there? This is z sub j. Well, we're taking this with respect to wjk, right? So the only term that doesn't go to zero is the term that contains x sub k. So, so that means that if I want to update my weight, so if I want to say the weight at time t of j sub k, that's equal to the weight I have t minus one j sub k minus my varying rate data times partial of the loss with respect to z sub k and partial of z sub k with respect to the weight j k. And so there's my update equation for the weight. So when I train on this particular example, I would update my weight like this, and we actually know what the values are, right? We know the value of this partial and of this partial, and we multiply them together using the chain rule to get our update for our weight in the linear layer of this. So that's going all the way from the loss end of this back out to updating a weight in the linear layer. Yes? Pardon? Why are you minimizing the toxicity? Because if you had y hat equivalent to y, is that not? I mean, you want y hat to match up with y. Right? That's correct. I want y hat to match up with y. You want to actually. Okay. So. You minimize the tail distance. Pardon? I would think you minimize the tail distance. It minimize the what? The tail distance. Well, remember the loss function here is the uh, is the cross entropy loss is motivated by underlying multinomial distribution of these data. So this is a negative log likelihood. There are different loss functions we talked about last time, and this is the cross entropy loss that we talked about. It represents a likelihood of the data. So what this is asking is, given the model, how likely is the observed data? We want to maximize that. So do you get the information you maximize? We're trying to maximize the probability, which means we want to minimize this loss. This is the probability of the data um, observed given the model. This negates it. So we want to minimize the loss, which corresponds to maximizing the probability of the observed data. Right. So why is equal to y hat then you get that so you maximize it? It's the probability. So when y equals y hat, it becomes zero. <clears throat> and remember that y is one hot encoded. So it's only one in one of the positions corresponding to which particular um, class of the training example is in. In this example. Make sense? 
I don't think I are a completely satisfied customer yet. I can tell that. <laughs> and you know what our goal in this class is 100% satisfied customer. That's, that's our goal. You know, it's, you know, it's like when you do this telephone call and say, we just don't buy it the end. Will you hire this person? You know, that if you were in a customer service business, you know, I'm going to always push the yes button, right? So, um, how else can I be helpful here? If what? If Y becomes Y hat? Yeah. Well, this is not an entropy calculation. This is a probability calculation. I mean, it's, but it is cross entropy, yes. If Y becomes Y, you get zero. That's correct. This is a distribution between the one time coding of the class label and the probability vector of what we think it is. Okay? So this only has a single place that's not zero. And that allows us to do this trick. Pardon? Yes. Okay. Okay. You know you're happy? <laughs> I am glad to hear that, you know? If you, if you become unhappy again, please raise your hand, okay? All right. All right, um, now we've updated the weights. What can we say about this? I just like, out of curiosity, um, you know, we talked about this. What happens if I say, what is the differential of the lodges with respect to the bias term, which is this little thing sticking out here? Just to check your understanding of what's going on here, because you can say, hey, you know, I went to this class, it was totally great, we're going to update the weights, and then your friend says at the cocktail party, yeah, but how do you update the bias term? And, oh, we didn't talk about that. I guess you have to update that too, right? So, what's the partial derivative of z subject with respect to b subject? One, right. So, what's going to happen then is that you're going to adjust the bias term whenever you adjust it. Simply by um, your learning rate. Okay? Good. Okay. So let's press ahead forward. That's great progress. We've got a completely worked example. And if you have other questions, recitation next week is going to talk as you wish about more examples of using the chain rule. But the chain rule is very important for doing back propagation. But I think hopefully we've illuminated the mystery of. Back propagation. One thing I will say is that as you form these partials, uh, when they are less than one and they're all strung together, what's going to happen is that your gradient is going to exponentially decrease. And you're going to have this vanishing gradient problem. And we'll talk about ways of dealing with that in about 15 minutes. But just be aware when somebody says vanishing gradient, you don't start looking for it under the desk because that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the exponential decay of the gradient as it goes through all these layers and the partials, the partials are less than one, okay? And you basically start losing the gradient altogether. And the gradient is what is driving your learning. But that's the key takeaway here. You're computing this gradient to learn how to change your model parameters to better fit the data and to maximize your likelihood of minimizing the loss. Okay. Now, how is this done in TensorFlow? This is a little snippet. Back where you probably can't read this, can you? Okay, yes? Okay. Well, this is the code from problem set one. By the way, there's a very small bug in problem set one, which has now been fixed, I believe, correct? Um, but you know what happens here is that I, the part I'd like you to focus on is in, in the very bottom, which is a training step. This is a, a function called train step that takes a set of inputs and the labels for the inputs and an optimizer. And what's really neat about TensorFlow is that you say TF gradient tape and it starts this tape running, sort of like a recording tape. And it's recording what you're doing. And then it works all the operations like this that you're doing, but it's recording these chunk, 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 okay? And then magically, when you say, um, tape.gradient, it computes 
that function automatically from everything that you have done so far. So it's keeping track of all the partials and actually it's doing this symbolically to make it more accurate and it gives you the gradient and then you can apply gradients apply gradients which is what we did in that step at the top of the left hand board so analogs here. all right so let's talk a little bit about um, how complex our model should be um, complexity comes in many forms complexity could come in the number of weights in a layer that is we could have many, many more inputs here, which would increase the number of weights. We could have more layers. We could have layers of different architectures. But fundamentally, if you count the number of parameters in a model, it gives you one metric for how complex the model is. So when we talk about the complexity of models, it would be really cool to have some sort of theorem about the complexity of a particular model class and say VC dimension, which we talked about earlier, right? Which is a measure of model capacity. That is for you to solve in your PhD theses, okay? Because it doesn't exist yet. The theory of these models is very <clears throat> underdeveloped, shall we say. But we still understand that if we were represent say capacity as number of parameters in the model, that the traditional view of machine learning is on the left-hand side, which is that what happens if you have a, a certain number of parameters, the more parameters you have in the model, your error on your training set continues to go down and down and down and down and down until basically it goes to zero. You know, if you have 100 data points and you give me 10,000 parameters, I can fit them exactly, no problem, okay? The problem, of course, is overfitting. If you, fit your training set so well, you're baking into your model all the noise and artifacts of your training data set. And if they give you another example in a test set, you don't do as well. So typically what happens is that, as shown on the left, as the model capacity reaches some optimal point, your um, test uh, set loss will be at its lowest point. But as you continue to crank up the complexity, the model will overfit and it will not generalize well. That's the key term. It will not generalize well because it's not able to take into account the fact that it overfit by having too many parameters. So that's the classic view on the left-hand side of machine learning. I offer to you the non cross side of deep learning, which is now a type that you can look at. The new theory is that as you increase the capacity of deep learning models beyond some capacity, if you keep going out into the Netherlands, way out here on the right hand side, you keep making the model more and more complex, performance actually starts to recover again on the test set. Well, why is this? Here's the way to think about it. On the left hand side, we're talking about a single model and parameters for that single model, right? But if you actually increase the complexity of the architecture and of the model sufficiently, we're no longer talking about just one model. We're talking about lots of different models. And so as you get into that zone, where you have a whole basket of models to choose from, the test set error can continue to come down because one of them is learning really well. Okay. So just when you think about how to trade off complexity for overfitting, just be aware that there is some empirical evidence. For example, on the right-hand side, you'll see, of all things, a fully connected network classifying MNIST digits. That's a task you may have heard of before, right? And you can see what happens in the number of parameters and the loss is a function of training. You see the training loss is the orange line, it goes down, right? Make it more and more complex, the training loss goes down. What's really interesting and a bit perplexing is that as you increase the model complexity, the test loss goes up, goes down, and then goes back up again as we would expect, but then it comes back down again, right? So just be aware that these large complex models may not be well behaved in the classical sense of machine learning. Yes? How would then such a model beyond this Interpolation uh, threshold perform on data out of sample out of the out of the same distribution, or 
it's going to still be just as bad. My, this is the question is how well would the model in this interpolation region out here on the right hand side function out of uh, distribution test cases? My assumption is it would do very poorly because it has no evidence to actually know what to do in that region of the input distribution. Yes. So if I understand correctly that picture, we start with like a simple model, so it underfits. Right. Then it increases and then it overfits. But then essentially the parameters are so many, you have like a sub model within it. Yes. And out of the many permutations of these submodels within it, there is one such that is like very predictive. Yeah. This is connected to the so called lottery ticket hypothesis. Some people have heard the lottery ticket hypothesis before. So the lottery ticket hypothesis in these models is as follows, which is that. Um, the way this is empirically evaluated was is that you build a very complicated model, right? And then you prune the model by taking out parts of it with a mask. And you see whether or not the mask model does just as well as the original model. And the answer is yes, you can actually mask off quite a bit of the model and discard it. And then what is left is still very functional. So the idea is that these very complex models have buried in them a lottery ticket that has won the lottery, so to speak, and actually can solve the problem and through all the random initialization and through this learning process, that one little bit of the model is actually quite good. You can throw the rest of it away. Okay. All right. So, question. Yes. So, it seems like once you've gotten to the interpolation threshold, you already pretty much perfectly predicted. So, why would you continue to trade? Well, you're not perfectly predicting. Look what happens. You see, when you get the interpolation threshold, the test risk has gone up. You can see here the blue line goes up. So the blue line is the loss on the test set examples that have been held out. The model has never seen them before. I guess that means any on the training. Right? Hmm? If, you, if it's already basically encoded all the training data, yeah. the model continues to change from training on that test set. If it's already encoded all the training data, why would it do better? Or, yeah, why would it continue to change? Because like, it seems like those derivative terms would go to zero. Yeah, so the idea is that there are, once again, this is, you should read this paper, it's interesting. Um, but the hypothesis is that inside this very large model, you're training many different models at once on the training data, right? And one of them may be a lottery ticket that allows you to actually bring the performance back, uh, have a higher performance going forward, right? Any other questions? Yes. In actual implementation, is we're talking about having multiple models. But those multiple models are really just different parts of the network. Yes. So you're just you start with a really big network, and then you have other tools built in TensorFlow that help you find the. Uh, network. It would be nice. <laughs> As of today, no. Maybe next year, yes. But also remember, networks can grow in different dimensions. They can be deeper, and they can be fatter. So we'll talk about that as well. You can make fatter networks. So it may be one of the component networks that's horizontal as opposed to vertical that's helping you. Okay. All right. So as also we talked about this last time, that another consequence of training too long is that you may overfit your model. And as a consequence, you may want to stop training early so as not to overfit. And there are a couple of different ways of actually controlling the capacity of models. Right? If you want to make sure your model does not run amok and just go off the deep end, how do you control it so it does not actually get too complex? Well, um, there are lots of ideas to that end. So here's a technique that lots of people have heard of and used called dropout. It's a very simple idea. You take a dropout rate R, and on every little batch of training data, you sample some set of nodes, each node would probably R, to eliminate and then you that smaller network on that particular mini-batch. And then on the next mini-batch, you select another set of nodes to um, zero out. And the idea is that you are reducing the complexity of the network on every training iteration and sort of regularizing by having many, many small networks that you're using as opposed to one large complex network and you average them all together in essence. And then there's some regularization you need to do on the weights to make sure it all works out. 
And so there's a, a dropout operator a TensorFlow, for example, that allows you to do this. And of course, how many people have heard of dropout before, right? How many people know that dropout paper was rejected the first time for not being interesting? How many people know that Google has a patent on dropout? Yes, okay. So, true fact. Um, anyway, so dropout, you can see on the right hand side that uh, as you continue to do training, which is weight updates on the x axis, you can see that with dropout, you get lower classification error, which is on the y axis, right? This is from the original dropout paper, which I have referenced down at the bottom if you're interested. You know, what other ways of controlling model complexity? We talked now about trying to control, you know, the complexity of the network architecture itself using dropout, but we can also do weight regularization, which actually controls the size of the parameters themselves. And there are th three kinds of weight regularizations that I think are most relevant to us. One is L1 regularization, one is L2 regularization, and the final is max norm regularization, which basically just clips weights once they're uh, second norm gets above a particular value. Now, L1 and L2 has really interesting properties. And I find the best way to understand this is graphically. So in the next figure, on the left-hand side, I've shown you equal contours of penalty on the left-hand graph for L1 and L2, where L1 is the square, and L2 is the circle. And the uh, perimeter of those two objects is a ISO penalty perimeter. Same exact penalty along that entire boundary, right? Everybody with me so far on that? Just on the left-hand side, the lines for L1 and L2, where L1 is the purplish square and L2 is the circle, those represent equal penalties against parameters that are following, following on the X1 and X2 axis here, on the X1 axis, that we'll hear beta one and beta two. Those are two parameters, okay? Okay, on the right hand side, each one of those um, sort of plots corresponds to a loss function where the bit in the middle is the lowest loss, okay? And when we add our regularization penalty to our loss term, as we do, right, we're adding together those two functions. And what we are searching for is the lowest loss, which is the summation of the two of them. So if you think about this in terms of the geometry of the situation, it's where the curve on the, from the left-hand side, the curve from the left-hand side intersects the loss function on the right-hand side. To actually minimize the sum of the two, two of them. So that point where they meet is the point where the loss is minimized. And what you can see is that for L2 loss, the circle loss, it's actually meeting, you know, it's sort of arbitrary points along the the loss um, landscape there. But if you look at the L1 loss, it has this very interesting property, which is that it tends to meet at the axis. And so what happens then is that L2 loss is minimizing the magnitude of all of the weights, whereas L1 loss is trying to sparsify the weights and force one or more of them to zero based upon this interpretation. Okay, so before I press forward, are there any questions about this? Because it's a little bit counterintuitive once you stare at this for a little while. But once again, the right-hand figure is showing you if you want to minimize the sum of these two functions, that is the sum of the regularization term and the, and the loss function that showed us those contours, that the way to do this is where they intersect at a given point, right? And that tends to be for L1 on an axis, and for L2, it does not appear to be on an axis, but rather minimizes the magnitude of both of the parameters, beta 1 and beta 2. What you mentioned around how L1 and L2 act 
how they act differently on the weight? Sure. How do L1 and L2 act differently on the weights? Um, L1 has the property that is sparsifying the weights, trying to force some of the weights to zero. That corresponds to actually intersecting at an axis, because when you intersect at an axis, that forces one of the weights to zero. L2 minimizes the magnitude of the weights overall, all of the weights put together. All right. So remember the if you look at the penalties here at the bottom of the slide, there's this term lambda. And that lambda is a knob you dial about how much regularization you want to do. As you turn up lambda, it makes um, more and more of the weights go sparse on you with L1, or it makes the magnitudes go smaller and smaller with L2. So you can control the complexity of the model by tuning that hyperparameter. How do we tune that hyperparameter? That's one of the reasons we have a validation set that's distinct from the training set. And the validation set allows us to tune hyperparameters to get the best performance on the validation set. So you use the test set to train the weights and other aspects of the model. You use the um, validation set to tune things like regularization and so forth, learning rate, things like that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so just thinking about this in terms of our gradients, if you look down at the bottom, you can see what this means in terms of gradients. That is for the um, L2, what we're doing is we're shrinking weights, right? Um, sorry, no, uh, L1 is adding a constant um, or subtracting a constant from the um, gradient. So it is shrinking weights by a constant factor, whereas L2 is shrinking um, a weight by some function of magnitude. <clears throat> so it's doing weight shrinkage. Excuse me. Um, <coughs> it's doing weight shrinkage uh, based upon the magnitude of the weight. Okay. And once again, this is our idea for stochastic gradient descent, which is that we're updating our parameters and we're going down this nice convex function, finding our minimum, right? Because for convex functions, convex optimization, we can always find a loss minimum. Now we've talked about these functions. Are they all convex? Well, here is a sample set of convex functions. All these functions are convex. And when you exponentiate a convex function, you get a convex function. When you add them together, when you take the max of them, they're convex. But it turns out that when you compose com uh, convex functions arbitrarily, the result is not necessarily convex. So what does that mean for us? Well, recall what we're trying to do. We are trying to take our gradients to move down into an area of lower loss, right? So what do these gradient fields look like anyway? You know, how complicated is this optimization problem? Well, some very interesting recent work was able to visualize these gradient fields. And so to give you an idea, here are some pictures of what the <clears throat> loss functions look like. And yeah, it requires some fancy flying here to not run into a wall somewhere or wind up at the minimum, right? Because if you pick the wrong place to start, and you follow the gradient down, because the gradient is the slope of, of that loss function, you're gonna wind up in some hole somewhere that isn't really a minimum. So that would be very unfortunate, right? But that looks actually pretty terrifying. It looks like something you know, like a Luke Skywalker movie or something, you know, you know, this spaceship you know, flies between all the, the loss function peaks and heroically finds the lowest point. Regretfully, Luke is on hand to help us today, uh, so we're going to have to come up with an alternative plan, right? And one way to do this is to sort of use our gradients in, in an intelligent way. I mean, this is the way we we're using them before, where we sort of uh, simply subtracted uh, some fraction of the gradient with a learning rate from our weights to update them. We could do a variety of things. For example, we could use our momentum method, which means that if the loss is decreasing, 
<clears throat> at a nice rate, the faster it decreases, we say, oh, hey, this is good, you know? It's decreasing, let's go faster. And so you start moving faster and faster by using larger and larger learning rates to actually be able to explore more space. And so you put the gas pedal on to gain momentum. Another thing you might do is to um, take an average of the gradients you had, right? So that you get a better estimate of which way to go. And then there are all these varieties of different ways of taking the gradients and manipulating them to try and improve learning in the context of these sorts of false functions. <coughs> so to that end, um, stochastic gradient descent in its purest form is you do what we did on the left-hand board, which is that you update on every single example. Mini batch gradient descent means that you accumulate gradients over a batch of examples and then apply them, which is what problem set one has you do. Then there are momentum methods. You can exponentially decay average of past gradients uh, and parameter specific learning rates, which means that you look at the value of a weight and the value of a weight helps inform you about what kind of learning rate to use on it. And eta delta um, is a parameter specific learning rate with a fixed memory window. And as you can imagine, trying to pick appropriate update methods has spawned a very large number of methods as described in this sort of family tree. We're not gonna go through this in detail, but suffice to say, if you look at it, you'll find all of the popular methods of modifying gradients and Adam is a good method to use, um, but the update equations for each of these methods is uh, shown on the next slide. Uh, we could talk about these in recitation, but suffice to say the idea is to try and navigate the complicated loss landscape we just saw by controlling how we explore it by these gradients and which sorts of slopes we choose and how to average over the slopes to get to a good place. Any questions about that at all? Okay, so here are a bunch of the update equations, uh, which you can look at at your leisure. Um, now, a final way to think about how to improve our gradient world and our uh, lost landscape, so to speak, is to think about how to re-architect our networks. So deep residual networks are now winning many competitions, including the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition competition. And so these so-called ResNets, or residual networks, are, have a very interesting idea embodied in them, which is applicable to lots of different architectures. And the essential idea is this, which is that one way to look at this is that you don't have these two layers in the middle, but basically it's a, simply a pass-through but the two layers in the middle actually fine tune the network once you basically have it sort of trained. The idea is that the, the bypass allows the gradients to propagate all the way through. Because right? if you think about what a plus operator does for derivatives, it's gonna pass the gradient from the top all the way down through the bottom. So the gradient won't vanish through those two layers. And then as you sort of learn a course estimate of the function you're trying to learn, these other little boxes can kick in and start doing a little fine tuning of the function, which will give you the ability to train much larger networks, much deeper networks that ordinarily be subject to this vanishing gradient problem. So that is um, one way to think about this is, is how to, uh, one way to, to, to look at this is how to architect this, and the straightforward way is to sort of architect it in a, in a linear way. The other thing we can do, in addition to the sort of linear way on the left-hand side, is to provide branch residual networks, where we have multiple branches of different models, and then we have a bypass around all of them. And now any one of the models in the middle can help fine-tune our function uh, to provide better performance. Uh, on our data. Is this clear to folks? Yes? Okay, great. 
The other thing uh, one can do is also architectures like this are a dense net, which is that every single layer uh, is directly put connections to every previous layer. So it isn't a strict ordering, but it's more of a graph, like a DAG, where basically every layer talks to every other layer before it in a dense net architecture. And thus, essentially, the deeper layers uh, are sort of once again, assisting uh, in fine tuning the function uh, as it learns. Now, how do these affect learning? That is, what can we say about when we have a resident, what it does for helping us uh, with our uh, reading search of parameters? Well, it's pretty remarkable. If you look at just a couple of examples, you can see that those are lost landscapes we looked at before. And here are roughly equivalently complex networks uh, that have been changed into ResNets. And you can see how much smoother the surfaces are. And it's on the right hand side, that DenseNet 121 is a 121 layer network. And that is the uh, visualized gradient of it. Now, why does it look like that? Well, you can imagine that that gradient primarily comes from the very first layer. And the other 120 layers essentially are bypassed at the outset. And then later on, uh, as the network uh, fully utilizes that first layer, the other layers can begin to participate and their gradients can become uh, utilized. Any questions about this? Does that make sense to folks uh, how this is working? Yes? Okay. So let me just sum up what we've talked about today. You know, we started with our model here, which is sort of a prototypical example of a linear component followed by a nonlinear component followed by a loss function. What we looked at was how to compute um, the various components of it. And we observed that in the particular case of one kind of coding, that only the winning class contributes to the loss. And that we can take that loss, we take its derivative, and when we take its derivative, we can use it as a component in a chain rule based framework for updating weights to actually improve the model's behavior. And after we see lots of training examples, these weights and offsets, the biases, are going to get updated to better fit the original data. And the nuances of how big your training batches are, what learning rate to use, what kinds of penalties to use, and we're going to have to do regularization, we're going to have to use um, uh, these sorts of resonance. It's still sort of a craft as opposed to a science, to tell you the truth. You know, it really is not the case that somebody can definitively tell you exactly what to do for a given problem. Although for certain classes of problems, people looked at a great number of different architectures and thus the literature will be informative about what has worked in the past. Are there any other questions we have for that? Remember, we want 100% satisfaction. Okay, well, that's it for today. Um, Professor Manolz will be here um, next week to talk about CNNs and RNNs. And one question, yes. So the on the Yeah, I can hear you. So the Does this rectified linear unit filter out signals? And that the answer is, if we compute the derivative of this function, right, it has a very interesting property, right, which is the derivative of this function is um, I use blue chalk. The derivative is zero here, and it's constant here, right? But this means if we back propagate through a ReLU nonlinear operator, we, we propagate all positive gradients and we throw all negative gradients on the floor, right? Which means that it's basically shutting off part of the network for updating. So 
and that causes people to want to do things like leaky routing, which is another nonlinear function, which is sort of like this, but it has a little bit of leakage on this side. Actually, the negative gradients sort of come through. Um, your question, I think, was, is this a concern that the value in terms of behavior during learning? Is that, yeah, yes, it's a concern. Um, once again, you know, one can use leaky ReLU, one can also just see what works in your particular instance. Okay, well thank you all very much. We'll have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.